but I'm not standing between my audience and a guy who put up a robot that blew smoke bubbles. Yeah. So I'm not going to say any more. I'm just going to let Alex talk. <laughs> uh, just starting off as a, as a disclaimer, uh, since this is a Kai talk, um, no math, no graphs, a little bit of bull. Um, so first I'm going to start off with my philosophy of the things that I do. Um, so I'm an artist and engineer, uh, which is an interesting title. Um, and a lot of people don't know what that is. Hopefully you'll get a bit of an idea by the end of this presentation. Um, so one of the things I like to do is take art and technology, smash them together um, to think about humanity. And my personal theory as far as technology goes and where it's been and where it's taking us uh, is the sort of monkey bone evolution idea. Um, so ever since our, our great ancestors figured out they should use a bone right, to, as a tool, uh, we've been integrated with technology ever since. Um, so a lot of people view humanity and technology as separate things, but I view it uh, as connected. Um, for example, one of the things I hear a lot is having an emotional connection with a robot's wrong. Um, because it's artificial, it's, it's, you're, forming something, you're forming a relationship with something that's, that's not real, that's put together by man. Um, but I could say the same thing for a genetically engineered poodle, you know, roving wild packs of poodles going around the world. Um, so it's, it's an interesting philosophical argument to have. Um, but uh, as far as when we go through this presentation, um, I'd like to think that technology is human, as human as language is, which also is an invented thing that we've made. Um, but imagine a world without language. Um, it was very hard to imagine a world without technology. Um, so you can probe some of these ideas. Uh, and there's a few topics of interest I'm going to go through in this presentation. Um, you can see they're quite varied, and some are more important than others, maybe. Uh, but these are the things I've been looking at for the past decade um, when it comes to robots uh, and interactive uh, installations and things like that. Um, so originally, I was uh, press the wrong button there. Um, so my thesis work at MIT was human-robot symbiosis. Um, so I was looking at things like it's hard for a robot to get up a set of stairs, but we got these nifty things called legs, right? They're made for us. Um, there are other classically hard problems for a robot to do, like say map where the bathroom is in this building. Uh, right, that's still a hard problem. Um, but what if you were to get a person to help you? What if you were to go around? And ask so that's Boxy. Boxy roamed around MIT asking people for help, had a cute little voice, um, and this by being very cute. Um, you can see the similarities here. Had very low set, wide, big eyes, uh, baby like voice. It is also tiny, um, so it's the type of thing that you might expect a robot baby to be, even though you've probably never seen a robot baby. Um, so it's important to connect with those expectations. Originally, we were going to make it out of this plastic that we laser cut, which you can see is scary. Then we moved to a material you usually don't engineer things out of, which is cardboard. Um, it's something very familiar, something you're not scared of, um, something you can crush if you wanted to. Um, <laughs> so it's not like steel. Uh, the robot would do other things usually you don't want a robot to do, like it would intentionally get stuck drive itself and flip itself over and seem helpless. Um, so these are all acts and interactions that the robot would do to try to elicit help, to try to elicit that interaction. Um, and uh, interesting things happened when people walked through the lab. So this guy was a runner in the Boston Marathon. And he had probably never seen the robot before, or any robot before. But he was laying on the floor telling the robot all his problems, how his uh, flight was grounded because of volcano in Iceland, and he really wanted to go home. And here's someone like, in the middle of a place like Xerox Park, right? If you saw someone laying on the floor here talking to a robot, you'd think he's crazy. Um, other people did other things the robot asked them to do, like dance. If someone dances for a robot, you know, you, you probably know you got, uh, you got something good going on there. Um, so these uh, designs uh, were also picked up by uh, a filmmaker and director who apparently were, were walking through the media lab when I had thesis demo day. Um, so according to Gizmodo that I found out later, the, uh, some of the personality and face actually came from, uh, from Boxy, uh, apparently. Um, so starting with uh, 
intimacy. I view these interactions people had with these robots as a type of intimacy, right? You're opening up to it. Um, you're doing things physically for it. I think that's really, really interesting and something we're doing a lot more with technology. So I think it's a topic that's worth a lot of investigation. Um, so these are the Blab droids. Uh, there were 20 built after Boxy, and these guys have been roaming around the world, making the world's first documentary entirely shot and directed by robots. Um, so this is something that hasn't been done before. Uh, and to me, that's really interesting because we tend to think as uh, of people being better to be able to pull things out of other people, whereas having a non-judgmental robot, something you can relate to, um, is, oops, sorry, uh, is, is something that I think it, we, we need more of. And we're actually right now running a test with an NPR reporter and a robot asking the same questions, seeing if they elicit different responses. Um, so the NPR part is actually, actually acting, has been acting a bit like a robot in some of her questions. And the other questions, she's been acting more like how she's usually been at a reporter. Um, so one of the things that these robots do, they don't actually understand what you've just said to them. They, they just go to the next question. So it can ask you a question like, uh, what are you doing today? Um, oh yeah, I'm gonna go work my thesis. It's like, where are you from? So just hitting you with these questions. And that actually worked very well. And when the reporter started doing those things, she started getting people to open up more and more and she didn't react to those questions. So it's interesting to even see how if a person acts like a robot, they tend to get these deeper answers. And some people, when they talk to the robot, sort of like a child, they speak to it like a child. So sometimes you get people to answer questions in a more understandable way. So you'll see an example here. What created the moon? The moon was created about uh, four billion years ago when a huge, rocky, early planet slammed into the Earth, something about the size of Mars crashed into the earth like two big wet pool balls, billiard balls, slamming into each other and ripped a big section out of the earth that went off like a big glob into space and started orbiting the world and it slowly cooled and it got further and further from the world over the billions of years until it finally coalesced and looks just like our moon does today. So truly, the moon is like the daughter of the earth. You see the way he, he answered the robot was in relation to how he felt about it. And other people um, would answer in different ways. So we looked at this emotional openness, looked to see if we could get people really to answer difficult questions. Um, so that obviously was a question specifically for him being an astronaut. Um, but we have other questions that are slightly more open, like um, if you can give someone any gift, what would it be? Um, so that's something open-ended, right? And you can hear it hear what you want out of that and answer it how you want. So we'll see an example of that here. If you could give someone any gift, what would it be? Give my mother the gift of not worrying about me before she dies. And she wants me to lose like a ton of weight and um, get really, really healthy. And she needs to see that before she dies for her to feel like I'm gonna be okay when she's not here. And I wish I could give her that, and I'm not positive I can. You asked. <laughs> See, quite, quite a different uh, reaction. Um, and when something is as blank a slate as a cardboard robot in front of you, um, you tend to want to tell it what you want to talk about at that time, um, which is sometimes hard to do with another person, right? You feel like they're even view the micro expressions on their face when you're about to tell them something. Um, so that's, that's quite interesting to me. And keep in mind, these people you watch are literally, she was like standing in the middle of New York City holding a robot like this in the middle of the street. Um, so these are places where uh, initially it might seem silly like anything that, like that could actually happen. Uh, so the next thing I'm gonna show is a uh, short uh, documentary about uh, many of the countries these robots have visited uh, some of the questions they asked and some of the patterns they've found. Um, and I think you'll be able to see a bit of the power that lies in this sort of interaction.
Myself. <laughs> I think myself. Myself. Her. Me. <laughs> myself. 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 Definitely myself. 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 I think myself because it all starts from yourself. <laughs> myself. Mommy. <laughs> <laughs> Ha <laughs> 
What is the worst thing you have ever done? To I switched out her shampoo for a near hair remover when she wasn't looking, and clumps of her hair fell out. And that is the worst thing I've ever done to someone. It's really underhanded and mean, but I felt that she deserved it, and it's very much so justified. And I would do it again to her in a heartbeat. I still don't like her. Shit. Um, I've done like a lot of shitty things, actually. Um, fuck. Yeah. I'm not like the best person. I've hurt people. I've put them in the hospital. I've lied to people. I've cheated on people. I've robbed people. I mean, all these are pretty fucking bad. <laughs> I can't say murder. Then you're getting uh, then the cops would be like, what? What? <laughs> Okay, so a few, a few examples there. Um, yeah, it's quite interesting what people say, and you can send 20 of these around a city, and it can work 24 hours, unlike you can do with a reporter. Um, so that's an interesting advantage robots may have. Um, yeah, and listen, uh, listen on all things considered for the end of our um, human versus robot uh, fiasco we've been doing. Um, so Alex, what's their survival rate? If you send out 20, how long does it take for? We've also? only had one stolen, uh, and it was stolen by a little girl um, who walked right past security. <laughs> so we, that was actually in Miami when uh, we were doing this Microsoft, and they had um, yeah, all sorts of like security guards, people watching that thing, just sort of walked by. And they, <laughs> I guess they weren't expecting a little girl to grab one. Um, some of them just break because they've fallen or that sort of thing. Uh, mostly, we lose them because the people we do um, shows with want to keep one, and it's hard to say no for the people that help fund the thing. So, um, yeah, they've been they've been slowly being rattled off. Um, we gave had to give one to Patton Oswald uh, to get him to talk to one. Uh, there's one right now under glass in the Vitra Design Museum in Basel. Um, so they've been they've been going out there, uh, and these were built about four years ago. Um, so we're looking to do the next generation. We have 4K cameras and Wi-Fi and other things. Um, so an interesting question emerges, like, why are people treating these cardboard boxes as alive? Why are they, why are they opening up to them in these sorts of ways? Uh, and a, a very old example, which many of you here probably know is Eliza, um, this, this little chat bot that wasn't very intelligent. Uh, we, got, we got people talking with it, got people opening up to it in similar ways and crying with it. Um, there's even a story of someone who helped code it was really getting into it. Um, so it's interesting that these social interactions that we have with people uh, transport over to these other environments. Um, and there's an even older study um, that was done with animation. Um, so there was interest around cartoons and things at the time. Uh, this is a pretty landmark uh, psychological study. Again, some of you may know this, some of you may not. Um, but this one looked at how people would form stories with little information. So things like shapes and movement. Uh, no sound, um, just our inferences at looking how things interact in their metaphors, just as the robot on its back indicates that it's in trouble or if it gets stuck, right? These are, those, are, those are visual indicators of things. Um, these shapes do something similar. Um, so I'm going to let this run. Uh, I'll be quiet uh, so you guys can have the experience yourself if you haven't before. And at the end, uh, think a bit about what you saw. <laughs> okay. 
That gets, that gets cited quite a bit. Um, and if you stand back and think about it, right, they're just these shapes moving around. We have this formation of story. Um, and I'm going to show a few works that I've done that, that play with this idea. Um, uh, but first, um, I'm going to talk a bit about, I might need the microphone by my speaker down here. I'm going to show a few of these, what I call experiments. Um, there's no real data taken uh, besides video. Uh, this is one we did with uh, BBC Future um, and ideas around uh, pleasure. And this, to me, links into intimacy um, because to, uh, through pleasure you become more intimate with something. Uh, what, may that, may, what may that be in a machine? Um, so I built a machine to try to figure this out. So I'm just going to pause on this guy's face for a little bit while I, <laughs> I talk there. Um, so there's been a lot of concern recently about intimacy with robots, with the future of our um, <laughs> psychological connections with them might be. Um, and there's a question, how, how would you build a machine so you can experience that in a public setting? Um, not many people can actually understand what it means to be pleasured by a robot um, until you try it yourself. Uh, so the interesting thing that happened was every time someone got out of that chair, they would turn around and be like, hmm, I don't know how I feel that that robot just gave me those weird, tingly feelings. Um, I think that's sort of important. I think that's one place where art can be a real tool uh, because this is not something that you can build uh, within the confines of a company necessarily um, to play around with. Um, so allowing people to come to their own conclusions when they have these experiences, I think, is super important. Um, obviously, when you have pleasure, you have the opposite side, which is pain. Um, so I built this machine, which continuously scrapes a fork on a plate. And it's a lot more grating in person, thankfully. Um, but similar idea. people people encounter it, they're, they're repelled by it, and then they're, they're not quite sure what it means that they had such a strong reaction to a machine. And to me that's really interesting and really telling um, because we're gonna, anything that can give you pleasure can also give you pain. Um, sometimes with that head scratcher, right, someone's hair gets caught in the thing and it pulls out a piece, right, and the, the feeling you have towards it is gonna change as much as you're feeling towards your car when it breaks down, you probably have anger, right? It's causing, it's causing you some pain. So to understand these things, um, I think it's pretty important. Uh, uh, temptation, the other thing is interesting. Um, so how could you create a thing that is so irresistible that you're drawn to it like a moth to a light, right? Playing around with um, a bit of that attraction um, to things. So. I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, have done this action once in your life. Um, kid, cat, if you look on YouTube, there's all sorts of videos of, of many animals playing with these things. Uh, so what would happen if you just put a ton of them together on a wall? Basically, people couldn't, couldn't handle themselves. They just had to go up to it. Um, I'd be a bit like, uh, a bit like human catnip, uh, which is interesting. Um, so when you play with something temptation, like when you go up to that spring, you expect a certain result from your action, right? Because you're familiar with what these things do 
somehow within your memory. Um, so this is a hotel bell, right? And these are also attractive. Anytime you see a button or a bell, you want to go and touch it. Um, and you expect when you touch it, you get a certain reaction back to you. Um, so I built a hotel bell uh, with a air horn hidden under a pedestal. <laughs> so again, uh, much louder in person. Uh, but in the middle of a quiet gallery, uh, you get quite, quite the looks. Um, and when I talk to people about how they felt after they did that, um, it's interesting. There was this feeling of betrayal, this some sort of implicit design language that we have here that when, when your cognitive dissidence comes into play, you get really upset. Um, and, you know, some people just laughed, but other people were like, just got angry at it. Um, and again, it's really interesting how these, these simple machines can create these um, really complex reactions. Um, all right, so I guess that naturally leads to control, controlling people. How can technology actually act as something that can, can change you in a way? So this is where I need Paul as a, as a guinea pig. So I'm gonna have you do is where, is where are these headphones? Let me just make sure they're, they're on. Okay, so put these on. And then uh, one, about one out of 10 people this doesn't work as well on, but we'll see. So don't speak yet. Um, so what I want you to do is just uh, explain to the audience what Kai is. Kai is a clown. <laughs> Full sentences, please. Okay, take them off, say the same thing as, you're tr as you were trying to do. That was very hard. Yes. <laughs> it's what, temporally delayed? Yep. It is, so these, this is a, say the same thing. Yep. Well, I don't know if you heard me. I mean, what is You're pretty eloquent usually, yeah. right? <laughs> So with the, this is a uh, headphone which feeds back your voice into your ears with a delay longer than your brain is usually used to hearing. So there's naturally a delay from when the sound comes out of here and it gets over to here through air. Um, and the frequencies are shifted slightly. Um, and the effect is that you feel a bit drunk. So you either go really slow or if you try to go fast, you, I mean, I can put them on. I'll be, I'll be you know, I won't, I won't do anything silly here. So when you try to talk fast on some people, it sounds a little bit like pulled out. Um, yeah, it's, it's. Uh, one interesting thing is I found people who are bilingual, if they speak their second language with them on, they can do it pretty well. But if they try to go back to say Spanish or something, they, you know, they, they go really long. Um, uh, yeah, one way to beat it is to speak really slow so the last delay has time to come back to your ear. Um, but this is interesting to me because it's, it's a, almost a form of electronic drug, right? People aren't really aware of how much your, your brain can be changed by these things, right? There's no, you know, he took them off and he was immediately fine. When he put them on, his, basically his speech was impaired. Um, and this is not something we usually on a day-to-day -day basis have an experience with. So again, um, this will be up here afterwards so people can try it and film yourselves trying to talk and that sort of thing. Um, uh, but again, a place where it's important to have these in-person experiences. Um, we did a demo. Uh, here's a, uh, this doesn't have sound, but this is a robot mask that you can give to someone and speak through them. Um, so actually you can control what they say. Um, and the, the fun thing here is the person wearing it tends to start like making gestures like they just can't help themselves. Um, and the person speaking takes on this authoritarian role of like, oh, what do I really want this person to say after a while? So it creates this power dynamic between you and the other person. So again, it's, it's a little silly, um, but it, it does create that, that type, of, type of control. Um, okay. Uh, Life within machines is also important. Uh, so as we're speaking with the robots and the shapes moving around, 
uh, the appearance of agency and intelligence um, when embedded in technology um, actually don't need to be that complex. Um, so intelligence, it, it, if you were to say something's intelligent, you would say it's, it's giving careful thought to something, right? It's actually processing something. Um, so if you were to look at a physics demo like the double pendulum, it's something made as a chaotic system, right? This is, this is something that moves around and it seems like it's sort of being random. Um, but if you bring this up into the third dimensional space uh, and have a sphere moving inside of another sphere, um, you actually create a dynamical system where it looks like it's making decisions. Um, that's exactly what I did. I took a ball that just rolls around and put it inside a bigger hamster ball. Um, and you can see here, it looks like it's, it's kind of struggling to get free. Um, this is another example, one of those simple situations that appear to be more complex. And as it roams around the studio here, you can see it bumping into things and seemingly making decisions about where to go next. Right? There's, there's absolutely no computation in here at all. It's just two mechanical things rolling within each other. Again, think of it like a third dimensional double pendulum. Um, and because when it, when it gets to that place, right, the, the idea is it's going to move around until it finds a path of least resistance, then moves away. Right? So the question I, I actually posited to a, a Berkeley philosophy professor was, if I had two of these balls and they both were painted black and neither of them made any sound, and I put a rat inside one of the balls, and in the other ball, I just put the other rolling ball. And if the motions of the two appeared to be the same, and as they're moving around, you can't necessarily say one is alive and one isn't. Then you come to the conclusion that either you have to say both are not alive, because they can't tell, or both are, because they have the, um, the attributes of making decisions. Um, so that, that's, that's an interesting thought experiment that you actually can, can put together. Um, so agency is more of a, a purpose to action. It's more of a um, reason for doing something. Uh, and Conway Games of Life, another old algorithm. Um, so this is an algorithm that has four rules um, in a 2D pixel space. Um, so if the pixel's on and off, it basically tells the other pixels what to do depending on how the other pixels are around it or on and off. Um, so here's an example of a giant one I made uh, in Boston. Uh, that actually was seeded with data from uh, a buoy about how much algae was around. Um, and here you see all these things that move around that appear to have reason and alive. You see that sort of thing flying off to the corner there. And these other things that are growing or changing or just flashing. Um, and the interesting things that were found in this game of life was that these individual types of um, animals and plant life, if you will, uh, kept showing up over and over. So that thing that, that flew off to the side is, is called a glider. Um, some of these things are called beacons or plant life. You see another one floating off to the side. Um, so again, these, these four simple um, uh, algorithmic um, uh, decisions can make something super complex. Um, and I think this complexity from simplicity is also important because now we're moving from, to complexity and things that are complex. Uh, with things that, like deep learning and that sort of thing. But we as humans don't actually need that much to really put uh, this agency into things. Um, so I think that's an important thing to keep in mind as we, as we add these intelligences in, that sometimes you don't even necessarily need that much intelligence. Um, and here are two balloons I put up that are electrostatically attracted and repelled just over and over. There's nothing here besides electricity and balloons. But the people watching it would describe them as fighting. Or when the humidity went up, they were kissing and nuzzling. Um, and again, it's this, it's this very simple reaction that we like to anthropomorphize. And finally, this, this older one that deals a bit more with individuality, um, were 60 clocks that were all started at the same time. And over time, they obviously deviated from each other. Um, the interesting attributes that people picked out here were individuality. So if you have one clock that's fast or slow, it's just a broken clock. But if that clock is fast or slow or broken in a community of clocks, now that that clock is lazy, or ambitious, or dead, 
Um, and these are the types of words people would use to describe um, how these clocks are moving when they experience them. Let this run a bit more so you can see the maybe a sort of a whole wall view in a bit. Also the fact that they had this overarching sound got people to really form this connection with them. And a few simple machines that I actually built on an island in Boston. You had to carry in all your materials. Um, these sort of more metaphorical things. As the sun went down, this would get slower and slower. People started feeling bad for it, like it was sort of dying towards the end, or towards the, end of the day. It's like when the sun was super bright, it'd be like, doo -doo 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 and it, people thought it was going crazy. This one everyone says mostly like a uh, metaphor for their life. Of course, experiencing it in the context of, a, of an island in the middle of a water is uh, you something a bit different. Um, so death, start with life, go to death. I think we're one of the few animals, if not the only animal, that, that have our keen sense of our mortality. Um, so playing around with that seems to be sort of ultimately human. Um, so this one I'll, I'll let run um, sort of from beginning to end to see if it elicits any sort of uh, thought or reaction from you guys. So I think the, t the two most common reactions of that one in person are uh, I should go out paragliding today or, uh, or quite depressed and sad. Um, and when you're in person with a drum, you get this very visceral feeling in your chest. So it's almost like you become sympathetic with this, with this machine. Um, so you, f you very strongly feel that, that emotion of your mortality. Um, how can you use technology um, and situations to get people to confront their emotions in a healthy way? Um, so this, this next video is actually how to use technology 
um, in a, a fun, gamed way to actually get people to really contemplate uh, very deep things. Um, you'll see a few people experiencing it. was chill and I didn't think of anything I thought of nothing cool sunset sunrises the first time I was down here when we were at the beach I got like tons of pictures and stuff I was thinking about Benny's chewing crackers my target emotion was lust and I was thinking of passion and desire My targeted emotion was rage. I, I play a lot of video games and I, I get mad at that a lot. My emotion was bliss and I got there by looking at my nephew competing against me and smiling. My grandfather, my sister, and actually my dancing family. But at the same time, like, I knew what the balloon was about to pop, so I was giggling. So there you get, you get people to, no matter if the technology itself is really sensing what's happening, you're putting people in a situation where they're totally engrossed in the game. Um, and because of that, they start genuinely feeling these things. Um, and again, you saw a few, uh, some of the text there, some of the interesting patterns we saw of how people um, would use this uh, to think about things. And this is another thing that's been, been traveling around, getting people to, uh, to try this. Um, uh, moving on to something a bit more serious, law and ethics. Uh, these are human values we gotta start thinking about in machines. Um, in the news, a lot have been like things like the trolley car problem, self-driving cars killing people. Um, which is interesting. Uh, there's Asimov's first law, which many of you probably know. Uh, if not, a robot may not injure a human being or through an action allow a human being to come to harm. Um, I think we all can agree that's probably a good thing. Uh, if you write his books, you know that's not quite enough. Um, so if you were to try to think of a robot right now that violates that law, um, you kind of almost get there, but not quite. So the two closest things that I found after talking with a lot of people um, is on the left here, something called the close-in weapon system on a Navy boat. Um, this is basically if you cross into a radar bubble around this boat, this gun will go and find you and shoot you, whether you're, a, whether you're another boat or an airplane or a missile. Um, but this doesn't quite make a decision on its own. It's basically a high-tech landmine. Right, you're entering into a space that detects you and it, and it hurts you. Right, it's not really making any sort of decision based on that. On the right, we see two people piloting a drone, and people like to say, you know, drone strikes are like robots making decisions. That's not quite happening in the military yet. Um, there's still a person in the loop really to decide um, uh, uh, whether or not to execute that person. Um, so, why not make something that does break that law? Yeah. This is a robot I built. Uh, after talking with people and, and understanding that no robot actually did exist that, that did that. Um, and it seems pretty simple, but there's some subtleties to it that I think makes it a place marker in history that it's the first robot to actually break the first law. If you know another one, I'd love to hear it. I haven't yet heard anyone come up with another example. Um, here are the four points that I view as important that it has completely really to do this. Um, it's, it's a non-random yet unpredictable decision. So really the ethics of this is that the robot makes the decision. So if I make a decision, like every time you put your finger there, it's gonna hurt you, well, whatever, it's like a mouse trap. It's not, it's not interesting. Um, or if it makes a decision in a way that I coded it to, that's just by proxy me making that decision. So again, that's not interesting. 
Um, so what I did is I coded in a way that it uses the sensors that then go through a one-way hash so that you can never go backwards and figure out how it made that decision. Yet the decision it made makes complete sense to the robot. So in the robot's mind, it made that decision, and the word decision can be very much contested. So I was in quotation marks there. Um, that's the first important part, um, which those other things were, were lacking. Um, causes pain and injury, and sort of as default in there. Um, you know, as an artist, I don't actually want to really hurt someone, so I, was, I had to think of what the least amount of injury and pain could be. So I landed on the little needles used for diabetes testing, right? A drop of blood is an injury. It hurts a little bit, so okay, check that off. Uh, autonomous, um, so it can't be something that's controlled. Again, that has sensors that detects when you put your hand near it and it makes those decisions. Uh, and it fits the definition of robot, which is another thing. Even the word robot is quite contested. By some definitions, a washing machine can be a robot. By others, people think the Terminator is a robot. Um, this robot has sensors. It's making a physical action on the world based on those sensors. Uh, and I believe that, that sort of fits the minimal definition of robot. Um, so this was something almost specifically made to get picked up by the media. <laughs> so to ha this is not something I want people to really, a ton of you to experience in the front of this room right now. Um, this is something to get people to start having conversations. Um, so uh, yeah, it ended up on, on, on many media outlets and many discussions about, is it making a decision? Is it a robot? Um, is there you know, drones and that sort of thing? Um, and again, having that discussion is something that uh, is a place where art can be powerful, right? To bring up these ideas. Um, and you know, we've seen this as much in political art as we've, we can in technological art. Um, another uh, project I played with is called uh, prior, All Prior Art. Um, so if you're not familiar with patent law, uh, prior art is any evidence that a invention already exists in a way that uh, uh, the, um, another definition from the EPO, European Patent Office, they say even cave paintings can be prior art. It's basically anything that you need to include that has something to do with your invention. And if it's too close to your invention, you can't patent it anymore. Um, so it, beca it becomes unpatentable. So I thought, wow, this, this to me in the age of, uh, of computers and algorithms seems quite archaic. Because um, I can write, I can download the entire patent system and write code that basically smashes together billions upon billions of paragraphs that describe mostly nonsense. But a certain small percentage of them will actually describe inventions that will then become no longer patentable. Right? It doesn't cost me anything. I'm running this on a shared server. Um, so <laughs> this isn't even using AI right now. I'm, I'm working on one that's using uh, uh, TensorFlow. But here, it it's just literally pulls a sentence from abstracts from all the patents from the US patent system, puts them back together, posts them on a WordPress blog, and tags them with a unique ID and the date, because the date's important. So the first number is the Linux, uh, Linux microsystem, uh, microseconds of 1970. Um, so here are a few of my favorite examples. Uh, this is a disposable diaper that's heated. Might be useful. Um, there's other garbage in there that's not that useful. Uh, a fishing reel that also is a umbrella and a light. Hey. That sounds that sounds reasonable. A uh, let's see what's all right. A, uh, a headlight which also holds urine. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we need that one day. Uh, Oh yeah, a fart detecting fan that also is shielded from electromagnetic interference, which could be important. And my sort of favorite one is a uh, maxi pad for dogs. So again, <laughs> many of them are pretty useless, but it doesn't matter because in the patent system, all you gotta do is publish this somewhere. I just put it online and I archive it on archive.org. I make PDFs that upload. Um, so anyone can find these, anyone can search them. You can search for your term, and if you find it's super close, there's a question if it's, if it's actually prior art. Um, this has been out in the media for a while, and there's been lawyers here and there. Some are like, yeah, sure. And others are like, I don't know, it doesn't describe uh, enough. Um, but the very fact that the conversation is starting is good, because I'm just some dude with a server in my closet. I'm not like Google who can put 100,000 servers to do this sort of thing if I really wanted to, or apply some deep learning principles to this in the future. Um, so I think it's important. We have a lot of laws written for the limitations of humanity. But when we, when we start having these algorithms become faster or smarter, it's, it's going to be interesting to see if actually our courts can keep up with the pace of innovation for those sorts of things. Um, and it's also sort of just a, a funny thing. Um, so uh, yeah, moving from engineering to art, creativity is something that's important to me. Um, there's a lot of debate of 
AIs can ever actually produce art if there's the inherent humanity to it. Um, I think we can, we can sort of go one-to-one -one with it. Um, and I think there are interesting things in algorithms that provide unreasonable and almost unintentional humanity. So here's a snippet of uh, JavaScript that I wrote. You could take a picture of this and run it, you know, save it as an HTML file, run it on any browser. And here's what it produces. Thirty minutes of music that never repeats exactly the same. And for those of you who know JavaScript, you see what it's doing is it's actually writing a raw header into this data stream and then using this math to then actually write to the wave structure as bytes. So this is not synthesized. This is actually written raw as numbers. But using our ears, listening to this, there's these patterns that come out. Right? This is musical. This is not static or white noise or, or nonsense. Um, and it's compressed, right? Like, this is not a lot of code to create that much music. And that, that to me, is super compelling and super interesting, um, this sort of explosion of complexity, um, whether it can be here or um, more intelligent code. Um, I think this is something we're going to see a lot more of and be surprised that our ears or our eyes can pick up on this beauty, um, which is not obviously inherent in the way that we notate things. Um, and here's a, uh, here's a canvas painting, sort of a uh, little Jackson Pollock, a little, little uh, impressionistic maybe. Um, that was entirely painted by a robot. Um, so you can see on the floor there, you see the paint cans on the back. Show a bit of a, I have to click this. Yeah, this is a bit of, bit of testing. Um, this is actually built for a uh, TV show which is coming out should be next month where uh, someone challenges a robot to a human task. So this robot was challenged to paint with another person to see who judges would think was better. Um, but that was not as interesting to me as creating something I call an inspiration module. Um, so <laughs> what can you use for computers or algorithms to be inspired? Um, so this particular one used light and color, sound, weather, tweets, seismic. Um, again, like the... Uh, Asimov bot, I wanted to program it to do it in ways that I cannot predict. Um, so to pick, it actually picks which sensors it wants to use every time it makes a new painting. So I don't actually know which ones it's going to pick from, nor how it's going to map where it's going. It actually uses what it learned from last time to pick the sensors it wants to use this time. Um, and these, these ever escaping modes of inspiration are pretty interesting. Um, and again, created something that uh, if you, if you ask someone, is this, could this be done by a person or a machine, it would be hard to distinguish without knowing more information. Um, and eventually things like wave net models can, can uh, push into this, and that leads to this, this most recent idea um, that I just put up on YouTube yesterday. Um, so there's this paper, the, uh, the Unreasonable Effectiveness of uh, Deep Learning, I believe, maybe a slightly different title. Um, the idea was that uh, even the researchers were pretty amazed how good their outputs were from these uh, deep learning models. So I'm about to play you a video of uh, a model I trained or a system I trained to uh, do impressions of people's voices. And basically what's interesting here is it pulls out what makes us who we are through our voice, right? This is something that's really like a fingerprint. It's really interesting how we're connected to our voices. So. You may recognize some of them. Uh, hopefully they'll come out good on the speaker. Um, there are some hints and clues. I changed the names to protect the innocent, um, but I think you'll get the idea. There we go. Oh, 
the soup and the food they were able to eat the crown milk and we have left up for the hour. Now we're down on the river map. Sometimes So as the intro said, no audio files were used to produce this output. This has all come from a trained neural model. Um, so basically, I can produce unlimited amounts of Bob Ross in perpetuity. Um, and uh, this is using uh, a WaveNet-like system um, uh, over TensorFlow. Um, the WaveNet paper is an interesting thing to look at. Um, and Google actually also demonstrated um, like unit selection. Um, so the step between this and getting uh, Obama to say anything I want is actually have all, has already been proven. I just don't have the hardware to actually do that or the insight to the algorithms. Uh, but uh, hopefully you picked up a here and there on people that you know, sort of the little characteristics that make their voice. Again, I didn't code it. So the, the model that was, used, that was used to generate all these, I mean, the, the system that was used to generate all these was the same. And you just feed it different data sets formatted in a certain way. So again, this has this interesting, unreasonable creativity uh, that's within these systems. And I think this is a really interesting uh, field going forward. Um, and just to sort of wrap everything up, well, what the heck does this sort of thing look like in an art gallery? <laughs> Maybe asking yourself. Um, so I'll show a short clip of uh, what my last solo show looked like with just a few of these things and, and some things I didn't mention around. And then we'll do Q&A and I'll have other slides running of other things I didn't talk about just sort of in the background. It did have music, but you'll get the idea. It's always fun watching how they hold the robots. So they're very careful. That one's popular on Instagram. The person watching the gallery did not like having that one running. That's a, uh, a canvas that counts how many hours people have been looking at it. This was a big installation in a basement where as people move around these lights and they sense them, they sort of turn on and off and follow them around.
Okay, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> oh yeah, sure. Here we go. I'll just there'll be slides of other things running in the background for visual interest. Um, I, I was curious where you get your inspiration. Yeah, uh, so it's part of what's happening in the media. It's part of what people are experiencing right now. Um, one of the things I like to do is think a bit to what's slightly sci-fi in the future. Um, so things like robots you're intimate with is something that's coming soon, but it's not quite here. So other things I like to take from the future and let people sort of try it now, like digital drugs that go in your head, right? I'm sure they're coming. Um, and the interest to me is getting people to try them and then, and then discuss them. Um, and inspiration comes to all sorts of places, uh, seeing how people, seeing someone yell at a cell phone or just seeing how people interact with things. Um, so I think they come from the world. Um, and some are just like, I guess you just sort of wake up, you're like, huh, what would be interesting if you could automate prior art, and that came from sort of figuring if I should patent the robots and that sort of thing. So sometimes it's just, you know, what's in the back of my mind at the time. Um, and having the engineering background allows me to, I don't usually have to worry about actually ha how I'm going to build this thing. Um, it's sort of like just having the painting skills. Um, so it's more, yeah, it's more coming up with a conceptual idea than, than executing on it. So with the question bot. Yep. Um, do they just like drive off the sidewalk into traffic, you know, down drains? Like, how do you stop that from happening? Yeah, different. Uh, they're in different places. Uh, the robots do have sensors. They have one under their chin for drop off. Um, they have uh, one of their eyes is distance. Uh, many of the times we have them like in galleries or rooms where they sort of roam around the room. People can pick them up and leave with them. Um, in the case of Boxy, my original thesis robot, I put that outside my door and just let it roam around. At the time, I didn't put any tracking in it, so I'd find it in all sorts of different places in the building at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, they, they, they tend to roam around. You kind of have to let them be on their own and sort of be OK with maybe losing one, because um, just finding one of these things and picking up and started talking with is sort of part of that, that interaction. Thanks so much for, for sharing with us. This is great. Do you mind showing and telling us about the head behind you? The head behind me, so yes. This is also new. Let me plug. I can plug him in now, so it's gonna be quiet. Um, so I've nicknamed him Fred until he gets a proper title. Um, so Fred is programmed in with the, uh, like I showed you, the WaveNet of celebrities. He he's programmed in with uh, the average of 50 voices. Um, so basically, he babbles. Um, and yeah, this is sort of an early thing I wanted to share. Uh, I picked this particular head because it's almost in itself. It's, it's got these perfect teeth, but everything else about it, it's uh, artificial. It's actually uh, the same thing that they use to train dentists. It has a bit of a creepy factor to it. Um, so having it speak tongues out of a perfect mouth, because it's all about speech, uh, was very interesting to me. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, eventually it'll sort of be on a podium type thing. Um, yeah, that, that's his purpose, is just sit there and, blah, 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 and babble. Um, and I'll, t I'll turn them on later uh, for people to come, come in here. Hi, um, am I jumping the gun? Um, Heather Knight, we've never met in person. Oh, hey. the group. Nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had two questions. One, how do people know when to pick up the lab droids? droids? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, they have a PIR body heat sensor. Um, uh, different versions have them in different spaces, but they're usually under his, under his chin. So as people would walk by it, um, so for Boxy, there was Boxy originally when people walked by it, It'd be, help, I need help. So we just sort of uh, have a cry. Uh, when when Blab Drive is roaming around, um, people would walk by it. It would stop, it would trigger it to stop moving. So you wouldn't pick it up, but it would be moving. Um, and it would also uh, say, hey, pick me up. Um, so just sort of create these cues to get people to sort of stop and, and grab the thing. Cool. Um, and then I was wondering if you ever bond with your machines and contraptions. Ever bond, yeah, it's interesting. Um, yeah, the robots certainly, because they have this sort of personable thing. There's, there's a bit of a, uh, I suppose, a bit of a disconnect because I know how the sausage is made, right? It's sort of like, you know, I've been in their heads. Uh, you'll see a picture here at some point of the inside of what a, what a blob droid looks like. 
Um, but I think I probably bond more with them the further I get from when I built them. Um, and then you know, sort of become nostalgic for them and that sort of thing and care for them. Um, yeah, it's this interest. I wouldn't call it motherly, but it's this interesting, definitely interesting connection. Um, this is really interesting stuff. I was wondering uh, if you have played with or have any insight into people's kind of social responses as a function of their sort of perceived agency of the robot. Mm -hmm. you, you sort of talked about how uh, there are a lot of things that aren't robot. They're deterministic or because they're sort of trivially obvious. In terms mm -hmm. of, have you played with sort of the, the sort of the function of the artifice and, and obscuring that to see if there are any changes in people's behaviors and responses to your question? I mean, those questions are not coming from that robot. Yeah. They're, they're something else. And so, right. So uh, not so much after I graduated, but actually part of what I did for Boxy, my thesis, was to try different ways it would ask things in different voices. Uh, so if it talked a little bit like just sort of matter of fact, people weren't really into it. But when you put a bit of emotion and character into it, people were really into it. Um, and uh, I, I didn't have any graphs in here, but the, there's a graph in my thesis that actually showed there was a correlation between how roughly people handled the robot and how well they talked to it, how many questions they answered, how well they answered them. So if someone picked up a robot and was like sort of like, yeah, sort of thing, you actually can detect that with something as simple as an accelerometer. Um, whereas someone, if someone carried it around, you actually can, can tell that their interaction is probably going to be a lot better. Um, and we have the two scripts. Yeah, the first script was a total disaster. The second script was great. And yeah, like the, the example where the plastic and the cardboard, cardboard was much better, more organic. Um, and I think it, it really varies on the machine. Um, so for like the head scratcher, um, people forget it's a robot after a while, after it's making them feel good. But when you get up and look at this sort of janky, wired sort of thing, um, people have a bit of a repulsion to it. Um, so I think definitely design and interaction play a role as much as how much you can see and how much is hidden, if that makes sense. Uh, <coughs> this sort of follows on from that question. Uh, I, I thought it was a f fascinating example that your uh, your bell in the gallery <laughs> that yeah. went impressed. and 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 w one of the uh, themes uh, brought up by the uh, that m movie AI was was the use of deception um, by by robots and, yep. and artificial intelligences, and and I, I wondered to what extent uh, people who uh, are interacting with with Boxy. If they knew that they were being recorded and that and that they're you know what they're ah, spilling out, yes. it's, are, are they going to get even more upset than the person who's just pr pressing the bell uh, and, and so forth? Interesting question. Um, almost 100% of the time, people know the robot's about to film them, and almost 100% of the time, they forget halfway through the interaction. So Boxy actually was very clear. It was a research thing. It had a red and a green switch. And at the beginning, it says. I'm going to film you. I have a camera inside. This film will be published online. If you'd like to continue, press the green button. If not, press the red button, and I'll go away. Um, or the blab droid just sort of says uh, either sometimes we actually have people sign release forms, depending on where we are. So actually signing away like a legal document that it's quite clear that it's recording them. Um, actually, most of the time, people are really grateful they just had that experience. So we have so many times people are like, I haven't thought about that in a long time. Like the woman who was crying about her mother, later her mother had died and she wanted this footage back because it was a time where she felt she had opened it up and hadn't done that in a really long time. Um, so it was a net positive. Obviously, you know, after, after Boxy, the you know, first robot, I was like, man, I, I bet I could get people's mother's maiden names and social security numbers and you, know, you just go long enough, right? Um, but I think you could do that stuff without AI, right? <laughs> you don't need much to con humans. Um, so I think, I think adding the AI equation, yeah, it could be even more intelligent, but we, I think we have those things already. A lot of the stuff you do is really cute, like having the child's voice. I was curious, do you ever do the dark side where you let people be mean to robots or you say like they feel betrayed and you say, okay, we'll punch the robot or something like that? Because I think you would have, I mean, maybe it's harder to control, but it's a, it's a whole bunch of dark emotions that people could feel towards robots as well. Yeah. I haven't done any that uh, you could be violent with the, with the, with the robot directly, um, but uh, I had been working on one that's a, a robot that only has a knife to touch people with, but it, well, it's a nice robot, but it's, the context of it is it only has the end effector of a sharp thing, um, and that's, I'm, that's sort of the type of thing I'm interested in seeing how people will, will interact with. Um, but I've, 
I don't, no one's ever like thrown a blab droid to the floor or like, I mean, they can, they're small or like this, but you could crush the thing, it's cardboard. Right. Um, but we never had anyone like, people have got annoyed or sad with it, but, but have never gone to that, that, that length. So I haven't, I haven't created anything specifically that's like physically cathartic, but you know, punching bags also good for that sort of thing, I suppose. Last question, here we go. You don't have to provoke a punching bag. No, yeah, <laughs> we're, we're quite quick to, to violence, I think. <laughs> I don't know if this is a question, but I was kind of curious um, in relation to, uh, I, 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 I'm still fascinated about how we still use sort of inter industrial revolution metaphors for discussing like human behavior. Like you had the lazy clock and um, as well as, uh, sorry, the other ones um, um, I'm not thinking of, but, but just did you, have you, um, done any other projects that have sort of like industrial revolution like type metaphors like I don't know if that's the right way to say it I think like why do we still use them it's just so funny that we still use those metaphors you know even a hundred and yeah so years ago it, it's so ingrained I think in, in in who we are it's also ingrained in our individual experiences as well like the balloons um, like I said a lot of people thought they were like sort of fighting and battling uh, and you know, you get more specific examples of something's on someone's mind, like how they answer the blab droids. Like someone asked me, are, are, the, is, are the balloons having a domestic dispute? Right, like where there's no, they're silver balloons. There's no, there's nothing domestic about them. Uh, but people project what they want to onto there. And the, the cleaner the design is, I think the more people can project on it, right? Because if I were to put a, a Trump and a Hillary balloon, right, that all of a sudden becomes political, right? It's, it, it, it buries that, context within a specific um, uh, a specific thing, whereas the, the more simple the design is, the, the more people can project. Uh, so yeah, if, the, if those balloons were going during the, the uh, campaign, people might have made it political as well, even though they were still silver. Um, I think it's just a very human thing that we do. I think it's probably almost ingrained in our survival, right? You have to make all these quick decisions about what's that moving thing? Is that alive? Was that, is that a snake? Right, so I think, I think it's almost connected to that and the way that we formed our social connections. Um, and I'm guessing if an AI ever did become intelligent, they wouldn't see what we see in these things. They'd see their own, their own thing. So let's thank our speaker. Feel free to come up and uh, try the headphones or...